Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. So, you know, let's get started. You know, thank you all for coming for the second talk of our robotics seminar series. It's a pleasure to have Cynthia Sung with us. So, Cynthia did her bachelor's in Rice University, then she was at MIT and graduated in 2016. So, welcome back, Cynthia. Thank you. Now, she is a professor in the grass lab at the University of Pennsylvania in the Mechanical Engineering Department. You know, she does work in computational design of robots, fabrication of robots, and, you know, her work has won multiple awards, including the NSF Career Award, and the OMR Young Investigator Award, and many others. So, Cynthia, it's a pleasure to have you, and we're looking forward to your talk. Please take it away. Right, thank you very much. I'm really excited to uh, come back to MIT and share all of the work that we've been doing since uh, for the last few years with all of you. Um, as the title slide here says, what I'm going to be sharing with you today is work that we've done uh, in design of origami and compliant robots. So before I get into the talk, how many of you are folders? How many of you do origami before or as a hobby? Oh. Some people, okay. So origami is the art of folding, right? This is a way that you can take 2D sheets of paper and you can turn them into interesting 3D shapes. Uh, this is really an inspiration behind the work in my lab, the idea that you can take a flat sheet of paper, you add some fold into it, you end up you know, with an interesting design. This is a video of me folding a traditional model, a paper crane, right? And at the end of the, after putting all of these uh, folds into the sheet of paper, you get a shape that's not only an interesting geometry, but also one that potentially can move, right? Something uh, that's really interesting is that if you then take this shape and then you unfold it, you get a crease pattern, right? And there's a direct mapping between the folds that are on the 2D sheet and the 3D shape that you get after folding. And this sort of relationship is really inspiring us in my lab to think about, well, how do we improve manufacturing? How do we make design faster for interesting and complicated robots? So using origami in engineering is not a new idea. Oftentimes when we think about origami, it's as an art or as a hobby. But if you look in different areas of uh, society, there are places where origami has come into play for different types of applications. So what you're seeing on the left, for example, is an application of folding for making a lens that's uh, very compact. On the right, you see a tower where people have used origami structures to try to pattern the tower to you know, make aesthetically pleasing blinds to block out or let in sunlight. Um, and in the middle, you see this you know, cardboard uh, chair, which is this proposal for dorm furniture that now you can build out of cardboard boxes and then once you move out of the dorm you just recycle it. It's really easy to get rid of this furniture. Um, or deployable structures like stents that people use in medical applications, right? So in all of these applications, origami has been used as a method for being able to create shape change, um, but also create these sorts of deployable, reconfigurable structures that then have in this case, architectural or, or medical functions. And we're interested in thinking about whether we can take advantage of these same sorts of ideas for robotics. All right. We're interested in seeing if we can take a, uh, make use of these same ideas for robotics. So what you're seeing on the left are videos of origami robots that have been created by other groups. Um, basically, the idea is the same, right? That you take these sheets, that you could fold them, that they turn into 3D shapes, and that then even after they fold, they can continue to move, uh, they can locomote, they can do manipulation, um, different sorts of tasks that you might want robots to do. And we're interested in what are the underlying design principles behind creating these sorts of machines, because we think that we can take advantage of origami as a method for creating these sorts of machines quickly using existing planar fabrication methods, which means that they're, uh, they're cheap and, and easily mass producible. And so within this space, one of the first questions that might come to mind is shape. How do we create different types of structures, 3D shapes, using folding and origami, structure, uh, origami uh, fabrication? It turns out this is a uh, a problem that has been studied for uh, many decades. I probably don't need to tell the MIT crowd this because there are quite a few, uh, there's quite a bit of origami work being done here. But in this space, basically what we know at this point is that 
any shape, any simple polyhedron that you might want to create is possible to create using origami. So you can take a 3D structure, solid 3D structure, and you can unfold it uh, using algorithms that people have proposed, um, sometimes even software that people have distributed, and you can generate a fold pattern for this structure. And so this is great because that means at the very least, if we wanted to create interesting geometries for our robots, then we should be able to generate those shapes uh, algorithmically. So here's an example of the outputs of one of these algorithms. This is the organizer. It was developed uh, by Tomohiro Tachi uh, and Eric Domain. Um, and basically what you do is you take this mesh, right? In this case, we have the Stanford Bunny. You input it into the algorithm. The algorithm does this process of trying to separate out all of these faces into a flat sheet. It adds in all of these folds and spits out this fold pattern. This is the fold pattern corresponding to the Stanford Bunny. And what you're seeing in the middle is a video of Tomohiro Tachi uh, folding this pattern. So you can see some of the light changes in the background. This, the sunlight is changing, hours are passing, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, quite literally, you do have a bunny, right? And so these sorts of algorithms allow us to take, again, 2D sheets, in this case, a square sheet, and turn them into really interesting shapes like this bunny, right? And so this is a really powerful tool for creating uh, 3D structures. I am, though, going to take some time to complain about these algorithms. So this on the left you see is the original bunny mesh. What you see on the right is the corresponding fold pattern. And the first thing I'm going to note is that this fold pattern over here is colored. In white are the faces that show up on the surface of this bunny. In gray is all of the material that gets tucked inside. So while you were watching the video, you probably noticed that there were a lot of like tucking motions that occur that are, the purpose is to push material onto the interior of the bunny so that all of these white triangles can be on the outside and form this bunny shape, right? So all of this gray material is stuff that gets tucked inside. So actually, these sorts of algorithms produce a huge amount of extra and wasted material that don't necessarily serve any purpose in the function if the function is to make this shape, right? Second, there isn't really a clear mapping between the shape of the bunny over here and the pattern. So I know conceptually that triangles on the surface of this bunny correspond to triangles in the pattern. But if I wanted to go in and say, well, I want to make the head larger, or I want to make the tail shorter, or I want the, butt, or I want the body to you know, change, be a different shape in some way, it's not exactly clear what I would change on the side of the pattern in order to make that happen, right? And so practically, what I might have to do is I actually just change the mesh and I just run it through the algorithm again, right? So another thing is that these sorts of algorithms that have been developed are, to, are designed for static shapes. So if I want to make a bunny and I want to put it on my desk, I can use this algorithm and I have a great pattern that I can fold and it'll be on my desk, but that bunny can't move. And part of the reason is because there's so much material that's been tucked away inside, and the purpose of these algorithms is to create shape, not necessarily motion, right? And the last thing that I wanna bring up is that because a lot of these algorithms are geometrically motivated, they don't have any concept of load bearing capabilities, right? And so if I want this bunny to do work, right, or I want it to move some mass somewhere, then this algorithm doesn't really take those sorts of aspects into account, even those, and those are the sorts of things that we really care about in robotics. Right. And so from the point of view of our lab, we say, well, actually origami is a really fascinating tool for creating these sorts of interesting 3D objects. But what we're primarily interested in is not just the question of how we create interesting shapes, but how we create interesting motion and how we do work. So in my lab, we look at a lot of different questions. Um, we're kind of at the intersection of multiple spaces. The first of these is computational robot design, where we're think, trying to think about what are algorithms or software or systems that we can develop that allow us to uh, design robots either uh, completely uh, automatically or um, with some small amount of human input. What are the underlying computational representations or algorithms that we need to do that? We have a large interest in origami-inspired fabrication because like we said, we think it's a method for us to create 
lightweight, cheap robots very quickly uh, that are also customizable. We, because origami structures are often made of thin sheets that bend, we do some work in compliant mechanisms and modeling compliant mechanisms, understanding how their design affects their mechanical behavior. And because origami is also a vehicle that allows us to make structures change shape, we do some work in reconfigurable structures and understanding how reconfiguration affects a robot's function. So combining all of these uh, different uh, subfields together, um, the question that we're most interested in is how do we formally think about origami-inspired design as a way for us to create new robot functionalities? And so we tackle this question along a couple of different axes. Um, one of them is mechanics. So we're interested in thinking about how does an origami structure produce a desired force response, right? But one of the things I complained about before was, well, a lot of geometric algorithms don't really take into account the strength of the structure or its ability to carry a certain payload. That's one of the questions we're very interested in. We're interested in thinking about how do we generate patterns with desired kinematics? So how do we create particular types of motion, particular types of degrees of freedom? Because a lot of these structures are complicated, we're interested in thinking about new fabrication processes for us to actually create these structures with less assembly requirement from the person. And we take all of these ideas and we apply them to a variety of applications. So what I'm going to do today is share some of the work that we've been doing in each of these different spaces um, to give you an idea of what the potential um, design, what, what the design potential of origami is. Um, along the way, if you have any questions, feel free to just interrupt uh, and we can talk about them, okay? Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is mechanics. Why do I wanna talk about that first? <clears throat> because originally, when I graduated from MIT, there was a lot of work in origami robotics happening in the lab that I was in and also various labs um, around, around the world. And many of them looked like this. So what you're seeing here is a, uh, is an image from uh, 2018, kind of a survey of different origami robots. And what you should notice is that many of them are small. They're about you know, less than the size of a hand. They don't really carry much, they can't do much work, right? And so the biggest resistance that I got was from people saying, well, origami robots are toys. They're not really gonna do anything, right? They're all just like flexible pieces of plastic. Like, well, what are they useful for? And so the first thing that the first mission that our lab decided to embark on was how do we prove to people that potentially origami robots can be useful, right? And so we decided, well, what is a task that robots do that is hard? And so we looked at this video. This is a video um, originated uh, from MIT, right, of a hopping robot, a very dynamical motion, you know, single leg that jumps up and down. Um, and this robot requires a lot of energy storage and release in that hopping motion. This is something that origami robots at the time could not do, right? And it's something that, you know, you, if you wanted to build a robot like this, would require some more traditional mechanical parts. And we said, well, this seems like a pretty hard task. Can we get origami to do something like this? And it turned out, you know, if you try, try to model these systems, that what you actually need is the ability to create tunable stiffness springs, right, or springs that actually have large stiffness compared to just a bending sheet. So the first thing that we decided to do was say, well, how do we enhance the strength of an origami structure? And one of our inspirations was this uh, Bellows theorem. The Bellows theorem is a result from geometry that says that the volume of a polyhedron with rigid faces is invariant under flexing. This is a really interesting result because what that means, well, actually, let me provide some intuition behind it. So you all have uh, made cardboard boxes, assembled cardboard boxes, right? Usually they come flat, and then you press in on two corners, it becomes a box, you fold the flaps down, it becomes a box, right? Once you do that, once you fold the flaps down, the box becomes rigid, right? Before you fold the flaps down, the box is still, still flexible, right? That's basically an example of the Bellows theorem, right? What it's saying is that once you fold the box down, once you fold all the flaps of the box and your faces, the lengths are fixed, right? So all of your lengths are fixed. The box then is now also rigid, right? And so inherently what that means is that if you have a shape whose volume changes, right? Inherently the, um, the faces are also changing, right? And so if we can design structures that are theoretically rigid but practically not, 
right? What that means is that the faces themselves are flexing and that amount that they flex corresponds to the amount of resistance or the amount of reaction force that they're going to produce, right? So rather than taking a rather, um, you know, mechanical uh, approach to, uh, to modeling these sorts of structures, we can actually take a very geometric approach to modeling these sorts of structures. And so what we did was we looked in particular at this bellows pattern here. This bellows pattern I can pass around. This one is folded out of five mil thick PET sheet, um, but it's basically this repeated conical shape, right? And what happens is even though the ends are open, practically the, uh, the shape of those ends is fixed, right? And what that means is that if we wanted to apply the Bellows theorem, right, what that means is that theoretically this structure is rigid, right? Theoretically it can't change shape, but practically I can I can't compress it, right? That means that there's strain in the faces themselves, and that strain creates creates uh, creates force. So if I take this Bellows shape and I put it into an MTS machine that is one that uh, measures the reaction force when I compress it, then I get a curve that looks like this. As I compress the structure more, then I get a reaction force. And what's really interesting is that by changing the geometry of this structure, I can actually change how much the faces need to flex when I compress the structure. And that means I can manipulate the, stuff, the stiffness of the structure and also its, uh, its other properties of its mechanical response. Like I can get things like buckling, I can get, I can get things like snap through. And so this was one of the first things that we did where we said, oh, well, there's actually some promise that origami structures don't need to be purely flexible. They can be quite stiff. And we can take advantage of geometry, not material, in order to tune that stiffness and get the particular types of response that we want out of origami structures. So we took this idea, and you know, the students, uh, Wei Shi Chen, who recently graduated, uh, and Shivangi uh, Misra measured the behavior of a whole bunch of different of these bellows with different geometric parameters. What you're seeing is that you get different force displacement curves. You can change the stiffness by almost three times. By, since these structures are hollow, you can also you know, nest them inside of each other and you can also get these parallel spring effect where you get even more, uh, even higher or lower stiffnesses depending on, again, the geometric parameters. And you can design the geometric parameters for your particular application. In our case, this hopping robot. So we took each of these springs and we basically replaced the leg of a rigid hopper um, or you know, the hopper that you saw on the initial slides with these origami patterns. This case, this, this uh, spring here is made of the exact same material that is being passed around right now. And what you're going to see is basically this robot hopping. The controller on this robot is the standard Rayburn style controller. It's the exact same controller that you saw in the video I showed at the beginning. And what I want to emphasize here is that all this stuff up here is just motors, controller, you know, some power source. All of that is two and a half kilograms. And the stuff that is actually dealing with the impact with the ground that is compressing and then releasing energy to create this hopping motion is this 50 grams of origami spring that is on the bottom of the robot. And so what we took from this was that, yes, actually, you can use origami structures to transfer pretty significant amounts of power, right, and to do in interesting tasks, right, from the point of view of larger scale robots. Not only that, but, you know, because these structures are soft, you can manipulate them in different ways. You can get this robot to uh, move forward or back at different speeds. Again, this is just using a standard Raber uh, style con uh, controller. Oftentimes, the question that I get, though, when people see these videos is, well, compared to a metal spring, how long do these structures last? Because fine, yes, you can create the sorts of stiffness that are required for this sorts of jumping motion, but probably the robot is gonna die soon, right? And so we did another set of experiments where we took this spring and we compressed it and released it over many, many cycles, in this case, 2,000. And what you're seeing in here is the force displacement curve over compression and then release. The first curve here in red is pretty different from all the others, but by the second or third uh, compression and release cycle, the, the, pattern, the structure starts to converge to a steady state behavior. And this curve in blue is a behavior after 2000, uh, 2000 cycles. So what we've seen is that practically these structures can also last a pretty long time. The one that you're passing around is one that I've brought 
around to different audiences for like over a year, and it's still alive. So I think that's also a qualitative uh, assessment of, of this, this sort of origami string, right? And the reason that I can do this is also because the, the strains that are in the faces of these origami bellows are quite small compared to the total amount of compression that they need to, that they need to experience. And so even though these, um, this robot has experienced huge, huge impact forces, um, it's able to survive quite a long time. So this robot, also because the leg is compliant, can move over multiple different types of terrain. This is, again, just kind of a um, qualitative evaluation, right? But we put the robot over a obstacle course to say, well, what happens when you don't change the controller, you just have the same spring leg, the robot's uh, hopping, and you see it's able to hop successfully over these different environments. So we were really ex uh, excited about this result because it means that origami structures are not necessarily just constrained to small structures that don't, uh, that don't do too much work. This is not the only example where we've seen this either. We can take these exact same ideas and then transfer them over to other applications. So if what you're seeing here is a different pattern that we've been taking a look at that also has, uh, requires um, deformation in the faces when it's compressed. And so we can take this magic ball pattern, compress it and release it as well. What you're seeing here in these patterns are where the strain is concentrated inside of the pattern. And that strain creates also some sort of stiffness of the structure. Because this structure also changes shape in a way that increases the volume and then decreases its volume, what we can do is now put a tendon inside in order to control that length change and that volume change. And then when we put it in the water, this structure can take advantage of the stiffness of the origami pattern now to create a jet. So this is our underwater robot. In this case, it's on the surface of the water, but we've since put it, we've since submerged it. And in this case, just by taking advantage of the origami pattern, we can pull, we can change the length. When that happens, the water gets uh, sucked into the robot. When you release the tendon, then by the natural mechanics of the origami pattern, it, base, it snaps back into its elongated state and creates a jet to propel itself forward. This robot, has a, uh, a cost of transport that's pretty similar to um, biological squids of the same size. And so what we're thinking is that by taking advantage of origami mechanics in this way, we can not only get lighter, potentially faster to produce robots, but we can get ones that also have lower energy consumption. So this has been uh, our exploration into mechanics so far, but we looked at these and we said, well, these are mostly one degree of freedom actuation, right? What happens if we want to create more complicated robots? So this becomes the question of kinematics, right? How do we create now origami robots that don't just create, give you the desired force displacement response, but rather ones that can create arbitrary types of motion? And so in this space, we decided to think about, well, a particular problem. Let's say that now what you want to do is create a Manipulator arm. Manipulator arm are a pretty common type of robot, right? And there are ways that we can represent the kinematics of manipulator arms. And so we thought, well, this is a class of robots that it might be pretty, pretty nice for us to start with to see if we can algorithmically generate designs for manipulator arms. So the, the problem that we decided to start with was this one. Given a DH representation, I'm, how many of you are familiar with DH representations? Okay, a fair number. So DH representations are basically a compact way to describe serial chain kinematics, right? So I can describe the kinematics of this serial chain using four parameters per degree of freedom. And this is a pretty standard way that, um, that people describe robots. So if I have this representation, then can I algorithmically generate a pattern for a robot with the exact, uh, with the desired kinematics. And so we thought if we can solve this problem, then now we can start to make a case that origami robots can also apply to a broad class of robots and tasks, right? So it turns out that the answer is yes. The answer is yes, and it's based on a compositional design strategy. So remember how earlier I was complaining about how normally with origami algorithms you can't really map your 3D structure 
to the fold pattern and the correspondence between them isn't, isn't clear. We decided that we didn't want to have that problem with our approach. And so we created a database of different origami parts that we said, if we can figure out how to combine these together into an arm, then, then we succeed, right? And what's nice about that is that since we're combining different origami models together, we can directly map parts from the arm back into, back onto the, the pattern and the parts, right? So we created this database of parts. In this case, only four modules are necessary. If you think about this, it kind of makes sense because if we're trying to create a serial linkage, what we need is rotation and translation. And we need fixed rotation and translation and then joint rotation and translation, right? And if we can figure out how to combine rotation and translation in different ways, then we can get arbitrary motion in, in three-dimensional space, right? And so what you're seeing here are the four, four designs that we need. This isn't necessarily all the joints or all the designs that you might want, but they're the only ones that you need. On the left here is fixed translation and rotation. On the right here is joint translation and rotation. And you should, if you look carefully, you'll notice that this one up here is exactly the bellows that I'm passing around, right? And this one here is, is a rotational joint. So we can take the parts that, that I showed you and then add them into our database. Once we have this database of parts, then the question becomes, if we want to create a robot with arbitrary kinematics, how do we combine these different parts together in order to create the desired kinematic structure? Right. It turns out that you can do this because of one major insight. This is that the kinematics of your structure only depends in some ways on the location of a joint. So here's my elbow, right? I have a axis of rotation right here, right? But practically, it doesn't actually matter if my elbow is here or is over here, as long as the axis of rotation is in the right place, right? The kinematics of my arm stays the same. Right? And so I actually have an extra degree of freedom when it comes to design for how I can place the joints in my manipulator arm in order to create the desired kinematics. Right? And so I can take advantage of that extra degree of freedom in order to design this structure in a way that makes sure that the geometry is valid and I avoid self-collision and I can, still, I can still fold the thing at the end of the day. Right? So our main result is that actually it is possible to turn any DH specification into a corresponding origami arm and not, well, I'll talk about this, later, into a corresponding origami arm in polynomial time. And the way that we do that is by mapping the problem, actually, into a path planning problem. There is a correspondence between this origami design problem and Dubin's planning, which we didn't expect at the time, but I think is kind of interesting. So let me explain how that works. So let's say that here are the joints, right? You have a, um, this uh, one that changes orientation, and you have this one that adds, adds translation, right? And let's say that I have a joint here on my arm and a joint here on my arm, and I want to connect them together with a rigid link, right? If I draw the center lines of these modules, I get this circular arc in one component and a straight line in another component. So if I can draw a 3D path between my starting and ending point consisting of just circular arcs and straight lines, then I can directly translate that path back into an origami structure, right? And so what that means is that this is actually, this is just like a 3D Dubin's path planning problem, right? And so what that means is that if I can solve the 3D Dubin's path planning problem, I can actually solve the origami design problem as well. And so I can take advantage of decades of work now in Dubin's path planning in order to solve a design challenge. And so we did some literature research and we found out that what people know is that if you have parts that you're trying to connect together that are more than a particular distance apart, in this case 4R, 4R is the, um, the radius of the links that you're trying to uh, connect together, then a Dubin's path uh, that consists of circular arcs and straight line components is guaranteed to exist. And so we can take advantage of this insight in order to iteratively now construct these, uh, these kinematic chains. So let's say that we start with an end effector here. We know there's an axis of rotation here for a joint that we want to add in. Then basically we can move the joint along the axis of rotation in order to satisfy our distance constraint and construct this Dubin's path. And we can do this iteratively over multiple joints in order to create then a series of joint locations that give us 
a structure with the exactly correct kinematics. Each of these parts on this path then directly map to an origami <coughs> pattern in our database. And then when you have this pattern now, you can fold it. You can fold this pattern and you basically get this tubular structure that looks like this. It looks a little bit wonky, but actually the axes of rotation are exactly in the correct locations according to the VH specification. And so one thing I want to note is that this is a tubular structure. So actually this insight that we can use Dubin's path planning isn't just constrained to origami structures, right? You could also 3D print this tube and you would get the exact same kinematics. So while we started being motivated by an origami structure, really these algorithms are general to also 3D printed or other tubular structures. But as long as we can create, we can calculate this path now, we can have, we can generate an origami structure with the correct kinematics. So here are some examples. This is a Puma arm. It's six degrees of freedom, pretty standard industrial arm. We took the kinematic specification for this arm, we just dropped it into our algorithm. This is what came out of the result. You might look at that and say, well, that's not a path I would ever want to fold or put on a robot. So, well, yes, there's some self-collision constraints that we added to the algorithm, which make the, make the path longer than it needs to be. And so you can remove those constraints, you get a sh slightly shorter path, it looks like this, All right? And, but both of these are valid in the sense that we can turn them into origami patterns. Now, if we give this problem, make a puma arm to a human, then they create a path that looks like this, which is much more efficient. And we actually went through the trouble of then generating the origami pattern corresponding to this path and turning it into this kinematic structure, which has the exact same kinematics as a puma arm. And so what we're thinking about now is we now know that it is theoretically possible to construct any serial manipulator arm out of origami, but how do we make that design more efficient and something that you would actually want to use in a robot? I'll get back to that uh, in a minute. Uh, if you're interested in taking a look at the algorithm or trying out uh, these patterns yourself, all of the code is online. And so this is, uh, we have a MATLAB version and we also have a Python version. And so you can just input your DH specification, get the fold pattern out, and then you can, you can try folding it yourself. So this is really exciting, we think, from the point of view of design, because it means that, first of all, origami robots aren't really constrained from the, from the point of view of how much work or what kind of you know, locomotion they're capable of. They're also not really that constrained in terms of what kind of kinematic structures that we can generate. Now, the really annoying part then becomes folding and fabricating these structures. Right, because the pattern that I just showed you on the previous slide took my student something like, like eight to 10 hours to fold, and he was already a very experienced folder by the time he started on that project. And so one of the other uh, thrusts in our lab is thinking about how we can create these structures uh, in a more streamlined fashion, and in particular, how we can get these structures to fold themselves. So, this is a, a video of a system that uh, Shuhei Miyashita worked on um, back when I was here at MIT with him. This is the idea of uh, self-folding, right? So the idea here is that maybe you have this pattern and rather than having to get someone to go in and fold it manually, you can, if you're smart about the fabrication method, you can get the robot to respond to some external stimuli, like in this case, heating. Uh, and get each of the folds to fold into their desired shape. So this was really um, an inspiration for me when I was a PhD student here at MIT. And but when we started thinking about the, the robots that we might want to create using the sorts of algorithms that we're developing in the lab, well, there's a big difference between this pattern that you see on the slide um, in the video and other more complicated patterns. Here, just the crane, for example, right? <laughs> What is potentially a difference, do you think? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so the crane kind of folds into itself, whereas that one has a little bit more flat topology. Anybody else? Yeah. Is it a question of order? Is a question of order? Yeah, so these are kind of Two, these two are kind of getting at the same thing, right? That in this case, we apply a global heat signal and everything folds at the same time, right? But on the right, there is a specific order in which you need to fold the, the faces so that they can fold into each other in the right way, right? 
And so we were thinking, well, chances are, if you want to make a folded robot in the future, you can't just you know, take advantage of a global signal, but you need to be able to think about sequential folding and, and how, we, how we deal with that in an automated fashion. So my student, uh, Gabe, uh, became really interested in this question, and we thought, well, maybe magnetics is an interesting way to go. So he built this system. It basically works like this. There's a sample here. This is your fold pattern now. It's a magnetic sample. And there's a magnetic write head. And basically, we can write a magnetic program onto this sample very similarly to how your hard drive works, right? So basically, we can take this magnetic sheet, which I can pass around in a bit, and then pixel-wise, at every, every couple of millimeters on this sheet, program it with either north-facing or south-facing pixel, right? What that means is now this sheet is magnetized in kind of a non-uniform manner. And so when we expose it to an external magnetic field, then it'll fold in a predetermined way, right? So this one here is already programmed. You can play around with it and see if you can feel how it was programmed because certain faces are programmed in the opposite direction to the other and they should snap into place when you fold it correctly, right? So here's, and what happens is that depending on how you program this sheet and the external magnetic field that you apply, it'll fold in different ways. So we can take advantage of this sort of fabrication system now and create more interesting uh, folded shapes. So here is uh, one example. It's a cup, pretty standard, simple origami pattern, right? And we're going to program it in this way. The, the faces in red are north-facing uh, pixels. The, the faces in blue are going to be programmed with south-facing pixels. And then we're going to move the pattern after it's, after it's programmed into the workspace of a magnetic uh, coil that's under this table that's going to first pulse the magnetic field up out of the screen and then down into the screen. And you'll see that when this magnetic field pulses, some of the faces fold or others fold. And they fold in a particular order, again, based on the pattern that was programmed into the sheet. And this is at slow speeds. So what this means is that now we can specifically program particular parts of a sheet to respond to these external stimuli, in this case, the magnetic field. Not only that, but we can also program these sheets repeatedly. So what you're seeing here is an experiment. So what you're seeing here is an experiment where we basically took the same sheet, we programmed it, folded it, programmed it again, folded it, programmed it again, unfolded it, and then did that over and over again. And what you're seeing on the right is sensor readings that we took uh, measuring the remnant magnetic field on the surface of the sheet over multiple instances of programming. And as you can see, the magnitude of the magnetic field that is you know, programmed into the sheet does not change, even over hundreds of programming cycles. So we can take advantage of the system now to do sequential folding, multi-step folding, and hopefully get more interesting and complex shapes. And so what you're seeing at the top here then are examples of the, the first set of shapes that we, did, um, that we did fold. Some of them require only one step of folding, that's this boat here. Some of them require two steps, but only one step of programming. Some of them require two steps of folding and also two steps of programming. And so now we can start to really push the limit into how these, uh, whether these, uh, patterns can fold themselves. So overall then, the fabrication process that we've started to think about is how do we now then layer these materials on top of each other, uh, very similarly to the original self-folding work that I showed you, but now we can layer magnetic, electronic, and other functional materials. So the way that we do it is we have this, the circuitry that goes on to either a plastic sheet, like a regular flex PCB, uh, or a magnetic sheet. We add in some adhesive and we cut out uh, gaps where the folds need to go. You can see that in the pattern that's being passed around. And then we fold these uh, sheets over in order to align all the faces with each other. What happens when you do that is you end up with this stack of different layers, magnetic, mesh, magnetic, and then circuitry, that then you can cut out and you end up with this pattern that potentially is active, but then also folds into the correct shape. And so my student became very excited about this process. He decided that he was going to 
create, take this magnetic sheet, put a whole bunch of LEDs on it, and then now we have this foldable display, right, that can fold into different letters and light up, in this case, into the pet logo. So all of these, um, these different projects are all um, our effort to push, push the boundaries on origami robotics, trying to see what it is that origami robots can do, how they can be fabricated, how can they do, do different tasks. Where are we looking in the future? Well, one of the things that we've started to think about is, I showed you at the beginning our effort to create uh, interesting robots that are able to carry large loads, but also have interesting kinematic structures, but I didn't show you the two of them together, right? And so the direction that we're heading now is thinking about how we can think more systematically about combining interesting kinematic structure with force-bearing requirements. So this is our quadruped. Uh, it's recent development, so this is like its first, its first try, its first successful run of running. We're, we're improving the, con the controller now. But this entire kinematic chain here corresponding to each of the legs of the, the, legs of the robot was generated algorithmically. And the stiffness of the joints in this leg um, were also tuned according to uh, the particular needs for, for this robot. And so now we've strapped these motors on and these electronics on, a whole bunch of wires you see, which we're trying to clean up now. Um, but the question is now, how do we systematically or how do we think about design principles for designing these kinds of machines? Um, in that area, we've uh, started to think about distributed algorithms or design algorithms for tuning uh, stiffness distributions over structures. And so if you think about the structure that I just showed you, it really is just like a chain of, of springs, right? And so if you put motors onto the structure and you apply forces in different ways, the way that these structures are going to deform depend on that stiffness distribution. And so what we've been working on is ways that we can optimize or control the stiffness distribution over these structures in order to create desired deformation. So basically, uh, the student Shivangi in this case has been working on models for these sorts of compliant structures where she said, well, the configuration that this structure is going to converge to eventually is going to be an energy minimum, right? It's going to be a minimum of strain, strain potential energy stored in the structure. And we can write down analytical models or you know, matrix uh, equations that tell us where that equilibrium is. Then what we can do is basically apply gradient descent like controllers to these equations or to this structure in order to try to drive the energy minimum in the direction that we want it to go, right? And so what that means is that over time, individual springs or individual stiffnesses in different locations on this, um, on this structure will converge to a state where this structure will deform in the desired way. So what you're seeing here is not a complicated leg, but it's really just a tubular structure here with six springs on every segment. This is, again, um, preliminary results uh, on this controller. But basically, this, the thickness of each of these lines tells you the stiffness of that spring. And so you can see in this case, if the whole, this is the simulation, if the whole structure is under compression, this, these springs over here are becoming softer, these springs over here are becoming stiffer, and over time the whole structure converges to bend so that the end effector hits, hits this point, right? And so this isn't currently in our design algorithms, but we're interested in thinking about how we can integrate these sorts of ideas and optimization approaches into our algorithms so that we can make sure that the way that we design the different parameters in these, uh, in these linkage structures um, works for whatever types of state changes we want in the robot. So in summary, uh, I've shared today some different approaches that we've taken towards origami robotics. I hope that I've convinced you that they're interesting machines, that they can do interesting types of tasks, interesting types of both locomotion um, and other types of tasks, that we can design origami structures of potentially arbitrary complexity, and that in the future, if we figure out the fabrication challenge, we'll also be able to generate them on the fly um, and uh, automatically and in a customizable way. So all of this work was, of course, not done by me. It was done by the students in the lab. So I've highlighted in green here the students who did the work that I actually, uh, that I actually shared. Um, I'm grateful to them, our wonderful collaborators, and of course, our sponsors. 
And with that, I'm happy also to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for the wonderful talk. We also have a small present to you. Oh, thank you. The Mighty Robotic Seminar. What is this? A bunch of chalks. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Different colors. Yeah. So now we have time for some questions. Sorry, while you know people warm up. Right. Uh, I'm curious. So you showed this quadrupeds, you know, with the spring with or with your origami material, which seems very exciting. So what do you think? Is there a pathway from going to the small quadrupeds to more larger one? You know, like the spot. For example, do you see that these structures someday could resist that much forces? Sure, yes, that's a very interesting question and one that I didn't talk about. Um, we are also thinking about how these origami structures scale, right? And so what we've started to write down are dynamical scaling laws for structures that um, are either thin shell structures like origami or regular 3D traditional machine structures, right? And so um, basically what happens when a robot gets larger is that the structure needs to scale, and for an origami structure, your mass scales with your length squared. Um, and then for a volumetric structure, your mass scales with your length cubes, right? But then also your actuators need to scale to compensate for that additional mass. And actuators also follow particular scaling laws. So by balancing the two, you can actually figure out for a particular design, what are the limits that, um, of the scaling. And so we're working on that right now. So far, it seems to indicate that for extremely dynamical motions, um, traditional like 3D manufacturing is still the way to go. But if you're working with um, lower payloads or, um, or if you're trying to do like dynamical locomotion without a large payload, just the robot itself, then um, origami structures can, can still win out. So, but more to come once we uh, actually formalize everything. Yeah, very excited mm. to look at that work. Yes. Um, so, for how do you imagine the actuators would work with this origami concept? Like, if some of them I saw there were motors strapped to the origami. Somewhere there were tendons. How do you? What ways exist? Sure. So actuators. Yes. For now, we kind of just use whatever actuator is convenient. Um, in a lot of cases, that is a DC motor connected to a tendon. Um, because a lot of our structures are tubular in some way, the tendons route really well through those, through those tubes. Um, at the same time, we are trying to think about what are alternative actuation strategies that work really well with origami structures. Um, and you know, smart materials are one option. So we have a collaboration with Xu Yang in material science. She works on liquid crystal elastomers. And she actually creates yarns that are like meters in length for these, for these materials. And what we're trying to do right now is figure out whether we can control them uh, electronically and how we can mechanically integrate her pretty soft polymers into our origami structures to get a fully integrated uh, robotic structure. Um, that so far has not yet been completely successful, mostly because of um, just the variability in the manufacturing, it's, it's really hard to actually connect the tendons to our structure and then keep them there over many cycles of uh, actuation. Um, but we are, we, we hypothesize that if it works, then it'll be more uh, effective than these sorts of uh, DC motor actuated structures. Regarding the volume thing, yeah. would pneumatics, would that work? at least for one degree of freedom at a time, kind of. Yes, so you could, also, um, you could also use pneumatics, yes. And actually, one thing that is nice about these origami structures is that uh, they are watertight, depending on how you fabricate them. So if you don't puncture any holes in the sheet and you just fold them, they're watertight, right? So you can use them as the bellows themselves, right? And you can activate them pneumatically. We have not done that. Our lab doesn't have too much experience in pneumatic actuation, but, um, but you could. Um, um, if the targeted 3D structure has a, is, has a looping 
structure or looping part or the origami sheet has a hole, <laughs> does it make the um, automatic design part uh, significantly difficult? Yes, so the question is about uh, closed loop structures or you know, right. sheets with holes. Um, so for closed kinematic chains, um, I think the issue is whether when we generate the design, the structure will not itself, right? Because we don't, since we're just using standard Dubin's path planning solvers and that don't often care about that problem, uh, we don't actually have too much control over what the path looks like. Um, but uh, if you can avoid the knotting problem, that should not be an issue. Um, as for sheets that have holes in them, I mean, I can't, I can't say for sure, but I would suspect that the problem is actually slightly easier because when you cut a hole in the sheet, you actually remove some kinematic constraints, right? That everything that would have been connected through that hole is no longer connected. So it might be easier, but don't, don't quote me on that. Thank you. So this is awesome. I'm really curious. Um, have you tried like with stronger materials? Like I'm just imagining you could like make an entire frame of a car out of like folded aluminum, like with crazy stiffness. Just could talk about that. That'd be awesome. Sure. So other materials. I mean, as for cars, right? And like, there's a whole sheet metal industry, right? So if you're not trying to create structures that move, there are existing manufacturing processes for folding things out of metal. Um, there's uh, there are people that fold things out of like carbon fiber, right? Um, and so all that entire world of manufacturing does exist. As for us, we have folded uh, robots, not only out of PET plastic, but also the variety of plastics, um, but also uh, some carbon fiber. And then um, we have used aluminum in the past for structural elements, like not moving joints, because once you fold aluminum too many times, it just breaks. Um, but other other materials have, have been okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I really like the work on uh, programmable magnets. Um, I was I was wondering, um, some of the paramagnetic materials that are easily polarized, um, they don't hold a very strong magnetic field. So I'm, I'm wondering if you've thought about how to maybe rigidize a structure once a, uh, you folded it into some kind of target 3D shape? Yes, we have. So this is um, uh, work that just, uh, we got results on almost yesterday, um, that you, basically what we're doing is uh, you can change the inner layer of your magnetic laminate to set, right? And so in the sheet that uh, I passed around, um, the inner, the, the middle layer between the magnetic faces is just a mesh, it's just a fabric mesh, right? But you could think about replacing that with, um, with, uh, with, with something else, right? So in our case, we, uh, we basically like 3D print the mesh instead, and then, um, uh, and then what happens is, you know, you can repeatedly heat up the structure in order to soften or harden joints, which means that you can fold the structure under heating, and then when you pull it down, it's, it keeps its, its structure, right? So like those sorts of techniques or like changing the material of whatever it is that you're folding uh, can help you to increase the strength of the structure. Great, we can take one last quick question. And then we have to the room. Uh, earlier, uh, you had an example of the construction of an origami robot in, that has the same DH parameters as a Puma industrial arm. Yep. I'm curious about the, I guess, like the abilities of that origami robot that, is it able to pick up things or like what kind of interesting tasks have you tried to make it do? Sure, so our, our, our Puma arm, right? So our, um, that robot uh, kinematically has six degrees of freedom. It's kinematically the same as a Puma arm. We. So it is able to actually follow the same trajectories as a Puma arm, scaled down. I, I should say that our robot was not the size of a Puma arm. It was like this big. Um, so it is able to follow the same trajectories. Um, we have not yet tested it for like load bearing or, or any of that stuff. Um, in that case, that branch of work was really just about geometry and kinematics.
Great. Well, thank you so much, Cynthia, for the wonderful talk. So let's thank our speaker once again. Thank you. And you know, we do have to vacate the room, so we moved all the snacks outside. So please stay for the social and enjoy.